Hi, everybody. Welcome. On behalf of the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation at the University of Manchester, my name is David Schultz, and I'm professor of synoptic meteorology and PI of the center. The purpose of our center is to develop a wide network across the university to bring together different researchers working on natural hazards and their impacts on society. Anyone can join, so please get in touch if you're interested in being a member. You can sign up for our network on our webpage. To stay informed of our activities, please remember to follow us on Twitter at UM Crisis Studies and check out our website. This is one of the continuing webinars in our series that's been going on since last summer. Many of them are recorded and online at our YouTube channel. Our next webinar is by Kevin Roy from Hiscox in London, and that will be at 1 p.m on March 16th. He'll be talking about what goes into catastrophe modeling and how they use those predictions in the reinsurance industry. The format of today's talk will be as follows. During the webinar, you can enter your questions in the chat box, and we'll do our best to get to them during the question and answer session. For now, let me introduce our speaker, Tim Garrett. He's a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Utah. He did his undergraduate in physics at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and he got his master's and PhD in atmospheric science at the University of Washington in Seattle. He spent time as a postdoc at Princeton and a visiting professor at the University of Lille. His research focuses on the measurement of snow and the application of thermodynamic principles to complex systems. The title of his talk is titled Jevons Paradox, why increasing energy efficiency will accelerate global climate change. Take it away, Tim. Hey, thanks very much, Dave, um, for the introduction. Now, Dave and I actually, we worked together, well, it was quite a while ago now, maybe, I don't know, 18 years, is it, Dave? But the uh, yeah. when we actually tried to figure out um, how meteorological variability affects uh, Saharan dust transport across the Atlantic Ocean. And I think we had a rather good time do, working on the project, even if we weren't entirely successful at <laughs> identifying anything that quite worked out. But yeah, it was a good project at the time. But today I'm going to talk about something very different. I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing, trying to perhaps simplify um, how we approach human systems within the context of climate change. And it's you know, perhaps a little bit taboo for perhaps a physicist to think about human systems. I mean, the idea often is that they're extremely complicated. But nonetheless, you know, as an atmospheric scientist, um, I think it's natural to think that human systems and climate systems are coupled. And well, to hell with it. Why not give it a go and see if we can come up with something that is perhaps approachable from a physicist standpoint you know, that may even be useful. And so that's what I'm going to refer to a bit today. And this is work I've been doing most recently in collaboration with Steve Keane of the University of College of London and Matthias Graselli, who's at McMaster University in Canada. And this has been work that's been funded most recently by the UK National Institute of Economic and Social Research. So, sorry, this is... So, um, you know, this is just a very simplified online example of how we can think about how human activities can alter future temperature, global temperature, average temperature outcomes for the planet as a whole. And we've got a lot of dials and switches on this thing. I mean, what, what we see here is this, these are the various global sources of primary energy. Over here, we see the temperature change as it increases going to 2100, and then are all these things that we can adjust. Now, the thing is, is that if we can adjust these, arguably through policy measures, we might be able to do something that leads to perhaps a more favorable outcome for our planet. And here, the traditional metric that is used to separate out the components of humanity that might plausibly lead to changed outcome, um, particularly with regards here to carbon dioxide emissions, is a well-known Kaya identity. And 
this is just an identity. There's nothing really insightful about this other than the division of emissions into four components. One is population. The other is basically our prosperity, the GDP per person. The other is how much energy we have to consume to generate a unit of GDP. And the other the final one is the amount of carbon dioxide that's emitted per unit of energy. So this is called the carbonization. This is sort of like an inverse energy productivity. This is our prosperity population. Multiply it all together, the units cancel, and we get ultimately just carbon dioxide emissions. So simple enough. Now, the, the way that um, climate economists approach this is to sort of conceive of each of these things sort of being like dials that could be altered to some plausible extent by policy measures. And so this is you know, a little bit dated, but it hasn't really changed since. Um, here we have the emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide here starting in 2000, heading out to 2100. And there's a bunch of sort of general categories of emissions trajectories that are conceived depending on how we alter these dials. And the, these numbers are actually still used today, 8.5, 6.0, 4.5, 2.6. The other names are just the models. But one thing I think is really important to note here is the way the climate ep economists approach this problem is as outlined in this paper from Nature. Emission scenarios for climate change research are not forecasts or predictions, but reflect expert judgments regarding plausible future emissions based on research into socioeconomic, environmental, and technological trends represented in integrated assessment models. Now, I think this is rather revealing. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, perhaps a meteorologist saying that their prediction is not actually in fact a prediction or a forecast, but merely some sort of expert judgment. Now that is a rather different approach than we incorporate in our climate models. There's a bit of a disconnect going on between these deterministic climate models that do provide predictions and these expert judgments by climate economists. And you know, this has a pretty big impact on the range of possible outcomes we think about. I mean, as climate modelers, you know, we, we do have uncertainty. There is, we don't actually know precisely how carbon dioxide is going to map onto a temperature increase, but we do have trajectories for each of these models that is considered, societal models are considered, the, there's a range of possible temperature outcomes. I mean, all of them are pretty hellacious to one degree or another, but what we see here is that these trajectories have a wide range of spread in possible temperature outcomes that's associated with the deterministic aspects of the climate model. So these are, this range here is effectively an uncertainty certainty being expressed in our understanding of how climate behaves. But note that this is as almost as wide an uncertainty as the variation in what the expert predictions believe is plausible. So we've got two major sources of uncertainty here with regards to how society will evolve and climate will evolve. Now, on the other hand, you know, this flexibility in the system, well, presumably it's not as flexible as we imagine. If we look at this plot right here, I, we, we wouldn't obviously infer from this that human agency does in fact have that much of an impact on climate trajectories. In fact, a very naive person might, I mean, I'm just being tongue in cheek here, might argue that the forcing of climate is climate accords. Because clearly the more climate accords we have, the faster 
CO2 levels rise. And of course, that's not the case. But, you know, perhaps more pragmatically, one would infer from this that the climate accords do not actually, in fact, have any impact on our trajectories. Suggesting perhaps that maybe we don't have as much influence. Those dials that the economists imagine perhaps are much stiffer dials than we, well, than they presume. And I think if we look at some of the data here with regards to the relationship between, let's say, GDP and atmospheric CO2, um, I don't know. I mean, if th there's an enormously tight correlation that one can see here, at least over the past, well, 70 years between atmospheric CO2 concentrations and the world GDP. And it's, that looks to me like being a straight line. I mean, it does change a bit as we go further back. Uh, these are Mauna Loa, it's just what we can measure currently. And these are um, ice core data right here. But we have this value, 1.38 PPMV of CO2 per trillion year, 2010 US dollars of world economy. Now, you could plausibly interrupt me and say, well, correlation is not causation which actually in this case, I think is fair, except that obviously there is a relationship between human activities as measured by the GDP and atmospheric CO2. There are a lot of steps in between, but these are nonetheless well correlated. In fact, one thing, one way I like to look at this is um, to say, well, I mean, forget about econometrics. We don't need to um, economists to measure the world GDP. All we need is an atmospheric chemist if I just switch this plot around, an atmospheric chemist could, you know, just go up with their flask to Mauna Loa, have a spend a pleasant year on the Big Island of Hawaii, and infer the size of the global economy just from the concentration of CO2 to an extremely high degree of accuracy, $585 billion of world economy per part per million CO2. So, yeah. So I, I, I mean, some, some of this stuff got me thinking, well, should I, can I, is there a way to constrain this problem? I mean, it looks a bit constrained and, you know, a fair number of years back, this was submitted in 2008 and that was after many rejections by prior journals. But uh, yeah, I submitted an article where I argued that there were actually basic, basic physical constraints on future anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide. And the paper wasn't terribly well received by economists. In fact, they were outright personally rude, which is which was a bit of a surprise at the time. I didn't really know that was, well, I didn't know to expect that. But yeah, I mean, and perhaps you know, arguably it is a bit ar arrogant for someone like myself who isn't an economist to try to come up with um, a physical model for the global economy. But I don't know, we're scientists, why not? I mean. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we just discard it. And I've read a bunch of papers on this since with various levels of approach. But the most recent one is this collaboration with Steve Keen, who is an economist, and Matteo Scarcelli, who um, does financial economics, but is more a mathematician, is well versed in economics. And we had a, we've had a wonderful collaboration been very gratifying for myself to work with economists who can tell me when I'm an idiot. Um, and we have this paper that came out, Past World Economic Production Constrains Current en Energy Demands, Persistent Scaling with Implications for Economic Growth and Climate Change Mitigation. And this is a bit what I'll be talking about today. So, okay, so I'm going to come back to this Kaya Identity Emissions Drivers. Um, and, and I'm going to talk in particular about one aspect of the, these drivers, which is the energy per GDP. So that's again, the amount of energy that is required by humanity to create an element of GDP, let's say a trillion dollars. So you could, right now we consume close to 20 terawatts as a civilization as a whole. The GDP is, I forget the number, but I think it's about $80 trillion globally. So if we look at this, we have this um, En-ROADS where we have the global sources of primary energy. 
and we have the resulting temperature change. And then we have these major components here, the two most important being how we alter the energy supply. Um, specifically, what are the carbon emissions associated with any unit of energy? And then also things like um, efficiency of transport and buildings and industry. And then we also have elements of growth associated with population and economic growth. Now, we have a new administration of the United States, you may have heard. And um, you know, one of the great things about the new administration is supposed to be that the Biden administration is more pro-climate than the prior Trump administration. Okay, so one part of the Biden plan is that it calls for more efficient appliances, equipment, buildings, and medium and heavy duty transport. This is explicitly stated in their plan. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. If we're more energy efficient, presumably in the future, we will consume more energy and there will be um, smaller carbon dioxide emissions. And indeed, we can take go to some plot like this. And if we increase the energy efficiency of buildings and industry and transport, just as Biden proposes, then these curves get turned down. We can consume less primary energy of all types, even renewables. And the temperature change in the future, this is the business as usual line in black, gets bent downwards by 2100. I mean, it's still rather horribly high, but it's a step in the right direction. It seems clear. What I am going to argue here is that in fact, this will do the opposite. That increasing energy efficiency will in fact lead to an increase in primary energy consumption and an increase in the ultimate temperature rise of the planet as a whole. And while that may seem counterintuitive, I want to emphasize that feedbacks abound in complex systems and we cannot do a simple decoupling as with the Kaya identity without acknowledging potential feedbacks that may lead to a result that's actually completely the opposite of what one would first expect. So, and this is actually an idea um, that efficiency leads to greater energy consumption that was first proposed by um, Jevons in the 1800s. And Jevons was an interesting guy. He uh, actually quite admire him. I, mean, I don't think he was actually all that great at school. I mean, you think about, you know, brilliant Victorians. He, he probably wasn't the most brilliant of the Victorians that were out there. You know, you think of the people like Rayleigh or, you know, the big names in physics that were at that time who could do absolutely everything. And I think Jevons was more just a very, very deep thinker and very, very earnest. And he didn't do that well in school. He was shipped off as his first job to the Sydney Mint in Australia. And there he actually ended up dabbling in meteorology. And he probably created, I think, the first cloud physics model that was ever created, is my guess. I, I, he got it wrong, but he introduced the idea of double diffusivity, which is um, a concept um, of significant importance for in oceanography. Um, he also wrote about catchment efficiency of rain gauges. And then he went off to invent the concept of utility, which is a very deeply um, appreciated concept in economics right now. Um, why do we buy what we buy? What, what, what motivates us? Um, it was him and someone else who were involved with that. And he got involved with energy economics and then went on to create some of the first logic engines. So is it really quietly and quite a broad interest. And, and he was also a professor incidentally at University of Manchester. So one of the things he's most famous for is this book, The Coal Question in 1865, where he states, it is wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption. 
The very contrary is the truth. Every improvement of the steam engine, which was what mattered then when affected, does but accelerate anew the consumption of coal. So of course he's referring most notably to James Watt's steam engine, which you could think of as having been, you know, one of the absolutely key developments in the progress of the British Empire um, and its development because it enabled, well, it enabled several things. One was it could pump the water out of the mines much more effectively, but also the conversion of coal to work was done more efficiently as well. You know, this is a bit tongue in cheek. You know, you could think of Manchester at that time. It all began when I bought an energy saving light bulb. I mean, I, I think, you know, it is pretty clear, I think, to think that if we are incredibly energy inefficient, how can we ever do anything? It is by being energy efficient that we are able to develop new industry to grow and ultimately consume more. Now that's a very qualitative argument. Now what I want to do now is approach this perhaps from a slightly more quantitative way but starting with by thinking about other complex systems. I mean just looking outside, let's look at a tree. Um, how does a tree grow? Well, photosynthesis in its leaves um, enables the conversion in combination with the roots. So the energy is absorbed and uh, matter is taken from the ground and from the air to create new tree growth. If this is done efficiently, then the tree grows bigger. If the tree grows bigger, then ultimately it consumes more energy through photosynthesis through a larger crown of leaves. Or we could just take the human body. The human body is also this complicated network that grows. And of course, an efficient body is a bigger network that requires a bigger heart to pump around the energy and, 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 you know, and convert for example, glucose to activity within the body and in the brain. But this applies to humanity too. We also have networks in humanity. This is a schematic and just pulled this off of Wikipedia of the internet. Again, it has this dendritic structure. These are airline routes. And my phone is ringing, so I'm just going to turn it off just a second. So scan lightly. Okay, so these are airline routes. And again, you know, it's on a different map, but it also has these nodes on um, branching that we might see in the tree or in a human body. And I think a key concept that has to be seen here is that it is the networks that are required to consume energy, not any individual thing itself. An airport is nothing without its connection to other airports. It's the connections that are associated with energy dissipation. And that also these networks, whether it's with a tree, the body, the internet, any one of these things are things that have built up over time. And so it is, we cannot think about current energy consumption without thinking about how networks, branching networks, have built up over an entire history. The history is a key component of addressing this problem. And you know, when I started thinking about these things, actually my reference point was something that's in my area. I do a lot of research in the area of precipitation, snowflakes. And we see this sort of branching structure in let's say even the growth of a snowflake. And you know, snowflakes seem very whimsical, but the way a snowflake grows is effectively by consuming energy and matter. There's a vapor field around it at a higher potential energy. We call this supersaturation in the field. And it is through an exposure to an energy gradient that matter flows from the environment vapor in the clear air to the snowflake to create the successive branching outwards where the branches by reaching outward increase the interface 
with the surrounding resources, the vapor field that enables it to grow ever faster. I mean, I think these ideas should hopefully map on to something where you think, well, gee, I mean, civilization, that's how we've worked. I mean, we have consumed matter and energy from our environment that has enabled us to grow outwards into new reservoirs to the extent that they're available, successively growing into this branch structure to create new consumption. So that is just, it's just a little illustration here that I created, which shows this sort of idea, which is that we have primary reserves of energy, they're consumed, and we have this branch structure and civilization, and ultimately the energy is dissipated in some cold sink, warm bath, cold sink, and this is an open system. The energy is constantly flowing through and then some portion of the energy is available to grow civilization so that it can become a larger system with greater exposure to primary energy reserves that consumes more. And so we can imagine there being some increment over time of successive increments to create civilization networks that consume energy, that consume ever greater amount of energy. Okay. This is a picture of my son when he was like, I don't know, three or four years old. Here he is consuming an apple off the apple tree in the front, or front yard. And he has consumption here. He eats the apple. Of course, he, the energy that is in the apple is used to power his body, but then it's converted into waste heat that ultimately through convective currents get transported to the upper troposphere and then our radiated space. Now, of course, he converts that apple into body mass that enables him to, well, and energy, which enables him to reach out for more apples as he's doing here to grow more. And so if we think about this child here, fortunately he was healthy. And because he was healthy, he was able to efficiently convert food energy into body mass, enabling him to grow. It was by being efficient that he's able to grow faster and consume more energy. A sick kid, I mean, heaven forbid the kid dies, but a sick kid could die. And would consume less energy, would arguably waste away because that process of converting energy to matter is inefficient. And, you know, here he is, well, this was last year. He's a much bigger kid now. And here again, the same process is happening, but the key thing here is that his current consumption as an extremely hungry teenager is tied to his past production, and it is tied to his past energy efficiency. It was by being energy efficient in the past that he is able to consume a much larger amount today. And a key component of this is that we cannot easily change the past. We're kind of we're stuck with the past. The past is past. And so his current energy demands are determined by something that is unavailable to him to alter. So I wanted to approach this from a way, well, can I map on these concepts onto economic quantities? And when I first approached this problem, I think in 2006 or something, like I knew that there was no fixed relationship between economic production, which is given the symbol Y by economists, and energy consumption. It turns out that we are getting more efficient with time at producing for a given amount of energy. And that's been steadily changing. And I thought, well, you know, there is this link to the past. Let's just do a time integral of past production. And so I found some statistics by Madison that had gone back you know, a couple thousand years. And on the basis of that, I 
created some sort of continuous function for economic production, which is this black line right here that went back to the year 2000. And then just did the boneheaded approach of thinking, well, why not do an integration of that to integrate over past production and see if that relates to current energy consumption. So basically W here, which is the area under the curve. It's just the time integral of all past economic production. It's a fairly simple mathematical concept. Now, energy statistics are not readily available for distant past. I don't, I think there's some significant problems with some of the prior energy statistics too, and the extent to which they um, incorporate, let's say, you know, river power that was used for transport or sail. But we do have good energy statistics since 1980 for, um, from various sources. And so what we can do is we can compare um, these key economic concepts to energy consumption. One is production. Um, that's the GDP. This is the energy required per unit GDP, and that's been dropping. So we're becoming more efficient. So E here, the fancy E is the energy consumption. So that's been dropping, just initializing everything with at 100 since at 1980, it's been dropping. And we have the cumulative production here, which is that new parameter that I introduced. Now, this is the key thing, the key result here, which is that the ratio of our primary energy consumption, E, to cumulative production, this historic integration, since 1980 has been effectively constant. It's this line right here. There has been no variability, um, as I kind of anticipated, and this is it's an exciting moment, of course, to find that there is indeed in the statistics no variability in the ratio of energy consumption to the time integral of past economic production. This isn't just a matter of correlation. This is just saying that these two quantities, in some sense, are representations of one another. They're, they're, they're tied. At least it appears so in the statistics. And the number that works out is that it takes 5.8 gigawatts of power production capacity to sustain each previously accumulated trillion 2010 US dollars of real gross domestic production. Now, admittedly, this is this is a little bit difficult to understand. And I, I am still thinking about, let's say, tree analogies and also um, how some, some aspects of neuroscience in order to how memory develops and how trees grow to try to come up with a good succinct explanation of how this works. Nonetheless, we do have this result, 5.8 gigawatts per trillion dollars. So let's come back to the chi identity here. So again, we have emissions is population times dollars per person times energy per dollar times CO2 per energy. What is introduced by this um, revised expression that I introduced is that we have a much simpler formulation now, one that doesn't involve population or standard of living or energy efficiency. It's just, if we have energy times energy, we, those cancel, we get CO2, that gives us the emissions. And that is the cumulative, that's just tied to the cumulative production. So that's much simpler. And we could express this mathematically, which is that the emissions are related to, we still have the carbonization of the energy supply to, to explain. So that carbonization would be, for example, zero, if it was all renewables. Now then we have the energy consumption rates, which is this curly E, not to be confused with the emissions. Now through that identity that I identified, this is a world wealth that can be cumulative production that's related through the symbol, this constant lambda. So that goes through, but then this is just a time integral of past real GDP, a summation, if you like, prefer, uh, past GDP. 
This is very simple right here, but it has some pretty strong implications, which is without decarbonizing, emissions cannot be re reduced without destruction of global wealth. I mean, basically we have the past here. The past is gone, we're stuck with it. This is a constant, it seems, which only leaves this as one of the dials, only the carbonization as a dial. Current emissions are tied to the past history of real GDP. The past cannot be erased. Civilization effectively has inertia. And it's this physical concept of inertia that I believe has been under-recognized in the evolution of human systems. The past is always with us. It determines our current demands and it determines our current emissions, but it will be carried forward into the future as well and will determine our future emissions. And so from there, we can just do some simple mathematics. If I take the emissions right here, take the first derivative with respect to time, that is the growth rate. Then I, that would be equivalent to the growth rate of energy consumption multiplied by the carbonization. Take the derivative of this, we're just left with a couple of, I, I'm assuming by the way that the carbonization is constant here. So assuming carbonization is constant, which of course it doesn't have to be, but assuming it is, then we have the GDP right here as being tied to a rate of energy increase. Well, that's interesting. More we produce, the more we end up consuming or and, and emitting. And then if I just divide by the rate of emissions, I get a rate of change. This is effectively a rate of change. This is a rate of change of energy consumption, a rate of change of emissions. And then that's tied to this quantity right here, Y over E. This is known as the production efficiency. So this is the efficiency of the system. The higher the efficiency of the system, the more efficiently we grow as with a kid and the higher our emissions rate. And this all rests incidentally on lambda being a constant. Again, higher emissions rate, this higher efficiency does not lead to lower emissions, lower energy consumption, but in fact accelerates the emissions and the energy consumption. So again, instead of this, where we have business as usual, the curves get bent down in the energy consumption with more efficiency, I'm arguing that the opposite will happen with increased energy efficiency. Biden may be anti-climate rather than pro-climate, despite I'm sure his best attention, intentions. So, I mean, what, what, what is the solution here? So I think, you know, perhaps, you know, tongue in cheek, you know, the argument is that, well, perhaps if we all switch to nuclear, but do it really badly, then we are both inefficient and we have low carbonization. Uh, so as perhaps we could adopt the Homer Simpson philosophy to mitigating climate. And, you know, it does, of course, it doesn't have to be nuclear, it could be renewable, but I mean, our argument is just simply that efficiency is the last thing we want to be doing if we are serious about mitigating or uh, climate change. But I mean, even if we don't get more inefficient, switch the amount of decarbonization that is required is actually on, just to stabilize emissions turns out to be incredibly rapid. So just to go back here, this current growth rate in energy consumption is about 2.2% per year. Now we could stabilize, maintain our growth by reducing the carbonization at the same rate, 2.2% per year, that would stabilize things. But that works out to a gigawatt of power per day um, of renewables replacing past energy consumption. And there, I think that's, that's tricky. A gigawatt's quite a lot. I mean, that's like a nuclear power plant today. And you know, I, I, I don't think we're doing anything remotely close. And a concern of mine too, you know, when I say that I look at snowflakes as an analog is that 
I'm worried that renewables are going to also accelerate energy consumption of fossil fuels. Historically, new energy sources have not replaced. They have either been additive or they have enhanced. So by having new energy sources, we are able to grow civilization faster, which increases thereby its demand for all types of energy. And I think an example here in the physical world is to look at a snowflake. Now this is a stellar dendrite and a crystal has a basal face and a prism face. The basal face is the one that you're looking at right now. The prism face is the one along the edges, but by growing outwards, it's a prism face that is growing most efficiently. That is the highest efficiency main mode of growth for this snowflake. But the fact is, is that by accumulating mass along the prism face, the snowflake as a whole grows so that it is increasing its basal face in such a way that it is also consuming energy along the basal face. And that is growing faster by virtue of efficient growth along the prism face. So just by analogy, it could be that renewables like the prism face, if they are more efficient as they are becoming, could become the favored source of energy. But by increasing civilization, the snowflake as a whole, the demand along the basal face may also grow or for fossil fuels. I, I don't know that this is actually happening, but I think this is something that needs to be considered. So I'm gonna conclude by just showing a figure from uh, this new paper where I considered this concept of inertia, where can we make predictions of where we're headed? Let's say we don't decarbonize. Let's say we don't get any more efficient. Just as a baseline case, let's say we just adopt the fact that we have inertia to growth, we'll maintain the system. We aren't actually decarbonizing significantly, even as it is, even with the renewables. The percentage of fossil fuel reliance is basically the same. So let's keep that and see where this will head. And it's very easy to create a very simple model for a carbon sink in the atmosphere. Turns out it's like one and a half percent of the carbon that's added gets soaked up by the oceans and um, the land. So it's a very simple model um, can be used to make a prediction of where we're headed. So here's the past, with the red lines, green dots, and the blue, heading up to 2020. This is based on this model that relies on inertia, where we are headed, which is really just a linear continuation, but it's where we're headed. Um, perhaps over this time. And then another thing to uh, consider is that the emissions that we have for society ultimately will equilibrate with land and ocean sinks. And that means that we are committed to something significantly higher before there is a rough equilibration. And there's a bit of hand-waving there because we actually never really equilibrate. But nonetheless, we have a committed and a projected prediction right here. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is that if we are to recover what some suggest we need to recover, which is an atmospheric concentration of 350 parts per million, then we would need to return to conditions that equate with 1960. So, 1960, the size of civilization was about one third of what it is today. Can we recoil to 1960s standards of living with associated with its population and quite vastly diminished wealth? I, I don't think that we can, but 
I think this is what would be necessary in order to reach that particular climate goal. So um, just a couple of questions um, that are in my mind right now. If efficiency is a positive feedback for growth, what are the negative feedbacks? Um, and also, should IPC emission scenarios appeal foremost to physics if they are to be coupled to physics-based GCMs rather than Right now, they're just using these expert opinions and not just and not deterministic models like the ones I've presented. So, in conclusion, um, even without growth, civilization networks require energy for sustenance. So, we're tied to the past and past efficiency gains, which enable the growth. And energy efficiency gains, contrary to what is generally believed, will accelerate growth of wealth and also CO2 emissions. And also inertia is, I think, an underappreciated aspect of humanity's growing energy demands. It's a simple concept, but I don't believe that the dials are as loose as economists would perhaps like to feel they are so that they can have influence on policy. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Great, thanks so much, Tim. Any questions from any audience members? There's one in the chat from Dave St. Germain. Could you speak to the proposal you've recently pointed out, the untax, which would replace taxes on labor with taxes on fossil fuels? This would greatly decrease energy efficiency by preferring human labor over mechanical labor, which was the norm for human history before the Industrial Revolution, even though it's unlikely to become a reality, could such a scheme help quickly enough? Okay, so okay, so let's say we reduce energy efficiency. I mean, I think what I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean whatever the proposal is, um, we have a lot of technology today that is inherently designed to facilitate our energy efficiency. Now, anything that reduces energy efficiency would essentially mean rewinding past innovations. Um, you know, uh, I mean, that's essentially calling for a purge of the world's intellectuals. I'm not sure that's something anyone's gonna go for. Um, and the collective knowledge of humanity is part of our past. It is, there is inertia to our prior innovations. They will not go away, um, not without some external force that perhaps imposes us um, a recoil to a far more basic way of living that perhaps will not support anything close to the population we have today. So, I mean, myself, I don't see us willingly going that route. Um, ultimately, it will be imposed upon us one way or another, either through resource depletion or let's say environmental loss, environmental damages through, for example, climate change, although there are other things as well. I know, I know that's a bit grim, but. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I got one. I don't know if you've watched um, Star Trek Discovery. No. Okay. So, so it's kind of interesting, you know, in, in, in um, you know, in the, in the Star Treks, you know, the Star Trek, the original series, Next Generation and so forth they've relied on dilithium crystals to achieve warp speed. In um, the Discovery uh, series, what happens in the distant future is something called the burn destroys all the dilithium, at least within their, their observable universe. And so they've lost the ability to jump to warp speed anymore. So they can only go through impulse speed and so what, when, when um, the, the 
crew of the Discovery arrives into this new future, again, through time travel, they um, find out that the, that the Federation is all dispersed. They haven't been able to contact or have connection with people remote in their networks because they've been unable to get there. It's, so it's a <laughs> it's almost a pitch perfect analogy to what you're saying that if you take away your cheap energy source, then by definition your network has to your network has to decay, contract. Yeah. And um, so, so <laughs> uh, and, well, I mean that's happened throughout history too. I mean you just look at the Roman Empire. I mean it split. Right. As, I mean, as Rome decayed, then, well, Constantinople took over. And, it, you know, there was the Roman Empire did continue to survive, but it wasn't connected the way it was previously because it couldn't maintain that centralized control. So fo following up, you, you started by saying that, that these ideas are, are kind of controversial among among economists. So even even with your most recent PLOS one paper what what are the kind of criticisms that people are levying on on this work what would what would they say you know that, that you've got wrong about about this if you could be honest or don't be honest and just say well, well so i mean i mean basically you know there's two approaches one is to engage and one is to ignore and that's you know largely the response i get which is to ignore if they do engage in the past which they have um it is i've received a mixture of personal attacks along the lines of don't play in my sandbox um to um saying that i'm wrong by way of misrepresenting what I'm doing. I mean, these are standard approaches, but my impression is that the field of macroeconomics is by definition right. And so, you know, when the field approaches how it does something by saying, well, this is how we do things. If things are done differently, then they are wrong, period, then they're I mean, there's no productive engagement that can happen. One of my collaborators something Steve, and say, well, the the relationship you made with Lambda there, it's it it just not part of our oh, yeah. and that, that would be a totally thoughtful way of doing it. And the, and some people <laughs> have done that, but they are not economists. And generally they're when they've analyzed it independently they've just come at the same conclusion and then got really depressed and then they tried to convince themselves that it's got to change somehow but um yeah i mean the the the, the constant sort of speaks for itself however it is interpreted it's it's just there i mean it's not I mean, I mean, there could be room for dispute on how I've analyzed it, and of course, I would welcome that. That would be that would be terrific. But that's not what exists in the economics field. Now, Steve Keen is an economist, and he actually has the fire in his belly to stick it to the neoclassical econom economists, and has written a paper recently about how climate economics is done, including by people who have won the Economics Nobel Prize, like William Nordhaus, and shown that there is an extraordinary reliance on expert opinion rather than measurement. So the way the climate economists have approached evaluating how much climate change will damage the GDP was by doing a survey of climate economists. And, you know, that's, that's not really <laughs> how we do science. You know, it's you know, this is this, universities, this, by the way, <laughs> what it's how we rank universities, you know, well, many, well, you know sure. the statistics that go into these university league tables are it, um, you know, exactly that people's opinions about which are the best universities. 
So, yeah, and I think really what ultimately has happened, though, is that the climate economists have trivialized it. They have come up with, and I, mean, I think I've got these numbers right, for a six and a half degree global Celsius, global increase in temperature, they predict an 8% drop in GDP from what it would be otherwise, which is about 10 times higher than it is today. So basically in a world six degrees warmer, we all get private jets, just slightly smaller private jets. And you know, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just such a huge, enormous disconnect between their world and that. I think most of us in climate science feel about what these numbers imply for the future. I mean, I mean, we look at, I mean, even just, even just 400 parts per million, which we've passed, it's not good news. Hmm. And so how did, how did, Keen's paper go go over. I mean, no, getting published in an economics journal is notoriously difficult for economists anyway. I mean, it's almost one of the hallmarks to yeah. win the Nobel Prize is that your paper gets rejected yeah, sure. by one or more economics journals. Well, his is wasn't published in, I guess, a top tier economics journal. Um, nonetheless, it's one of the most highly viewed papers. I mean, they have these, what these metrics for how much papers get viewed and it's been viewed and in just an insane amount. I mean, it's, it's one of, it's in the top few hundred papers of all time, I think, of, mm -hmm. of the views. And it's written in a very engaging, slightly obstreperous style. But I, you know, I think that serves a purpose in this case because certain things do need to be said bluntly. And so his engagement with these economists would be like, they, they would come back to him and just ignore him or do they actually- Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's fairly pugilistic on both sides. But the response um, that Steve Keen gets is a fair number of personal attacks, like basically diminishing his relevance. Well, it's just, you know, classic schoolyard bullying. And he stands up to it quite well. <laughs> I don't worry. <laughs> Another question in the chat box. Do you think there's any hope that the various degrowth ideas will gain traction and become policy somehow? If not, then, then what's the end game? So what, one thing that's very important to think about is what degrowth rec uh, represents. I mean, when people talk about growth of the GDP, that's effectively an acceleration of our current growth. So the GDP is growth. GDP growth is growth of, G of growth. So it represents effectively a super exponential growth. So if someone is purely talking about degrowth but maintaining the GDP, then, well, then there is still going to be growth. I mean, the, the whole economic system is based on growth. Now, if you're talking about um, actually shrinking, humanity's demands, then I would advocate being more blunt and using words like collapse. So, you know, a lot of the people who promoted this line are French. You know, they talk about, well, degrowth movement, I think a large it comes from France also. There's a lot of interest in collapse in France. So I wouldn't say that there's blindness there, but nonetheless, collapse would lead to lower energy consumption, but it's it's a pretty grim implication. I mean, collapse is, <laughs> it's collapse. I mean, I don't know, I don't see a way out from the predicament. I hope there is one, but I think all systems go through periods of growth and then collapse. And ours will presumably come sooner rather than later. Any other final questions for Tim? If not, thank, thank you again, Tim. 
And uh, our next seminar again will be March 16th at 1 p.m. with Kevin Roy from Hiscox. Thanks a lot. See you later. Okay. Thanks.